Professor Haney, I want to turn to you about um, maybe the inter American and international context of, of what solitary confinement looks like. Now, I'm sure uh, there's quite a range, but um, how could you compare Canada's system as described by, by, uh, by Howard just in the, in the last segment to, to what happens in the United States? And is there a way to even generalize about what the solitary confinement experience looks like in American or international prisons? Sure. Well, Canada and the United States are similar in the sense that both countries are in the, the, the process of very seriously reevaluating how they think about and how they use solitary confinement. I think it's fair to say both countries over the last 40 or 50 years began to use this as a, um, as a mechanism or a device to try to control prisoners, oftentimes without much concern for its impact on the prisoners, how they were being psychologically damaged by the experience. But the last 50 years of research has underscored the extent to which people really are harmed by the experience of being placed in isolation. So both countries are now in the throes of trying to reconfigure what they do in order to both protect other prisoners, protect correctional officers, protect the inmates themselves who are at risk of being placed in solitary confinement, but to do it in a way that is more humane that places time limits on how long somebody can be kept there. Uh, as Howard was saying earlier, what kinds of activities they have access to while they're there to, to essentially try to distinguish the issue of separating people from the general prison population from isolating people where they're deprived of meaningful human social contact, deprived of programming and so on. None of which does much good in terms of maintaining order, maintaining safety, protecting the health and well-being of anybody in the prison system. Um, and so we're trying to devise different ways of accomplishing well-justified, meaningful goals, but to do so in a way that doesn't harm people. So there's a lot of parallels in both countries. Uh, Professor Haney, I want to follow up on what you just said about the psychological harm. Like, Could you elaborate on what type of harms solitary confinement or isolation can have on prisoners and maybe explain to our viewers why why they should care about that I mean we're talking about about sometimes people who have committed horrible crimes and I want people to understand that even people who society has has convicted and who have committed abhorrent acts should still be entitled to humane treatment maybe you could elaborate on on that on both of those points what's the harm here and and why should people care well, the harm is often devastating, and I, you know, I think maybe maybe your 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 uh, audience can can reflect for a bit on the social isolation that we've all been through collectively in just the last year and a half. A much much more modest uh, form of isolation. Social isolation, we understand it itself, uh, can be a devastating psychological experience, and then if you add on to that all the other deprivations and all of the other kind of oppressive forms of control that take place inside prisons, it can be a very harmful and even dangerous experience for people to go through. Um, uh, high levels of depression, high levels of anxiety, cognitive difficulties, the highest rates of suicide that occur in any prison system occur in its isolation units. Why should we care? Well, we should care because we're both countries, humane societies. We have principles of, uh, that, that uh, obligate us to treat all of our citizens in humane ways. That's the first concern. There's even a more pragmatic concern, which is that if we damage people and we hurt them and we transform them in negative ways, the overwhelming majority of them are going to be released someday from prison. Um, all of us, I think, would like to live uh, with neighbors who have not been uh, destroyed or damaged by the experience of, of imprisonment so that they have a more difficult time reintegrating in a, in a meaningful and contributing and productive way into the larger society. So there's a humanitarian set of concerns and there's a pragmatic or practical set of concerns and I think they, they connect or they should connect to all of us. Mr. Sapers, we've only got about 30 seconds in this segment. Anything you wanna to add to that? Well, I think it's important to remember that people are sent to prison as their punishment, not for punishment. In other words, the courts have said you're guilty, you're going to go to jail, you have to be separated from society. That's the punishment. Once you're in prison, the goal is to prepare you for release so you can be functional and live legally and safely in the community. So 
all of our rules, all of our policy, all of our procedures are all geared towards achieving that end. And you can't do that if you lock somebody up and isolate them for people throughout their sentence. It, it, it's, it's just totally incompatible.